Hello. Thank you all for coming to uh, uh, this installment of the presentations that I do here at the Ashland Senior Center. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Um, there are 68 of us. There might be 69 now. We keep growing. Well, there are 68 of us, I think. Um, about 40 in Worcester, about 20 in uh, Westboro, and the rest in Boston. What I like about Myrick O'Connell is that everybody, there's so many of us that everybody gets to do what they like and I get to do this, which is elder law. Um, so my median client age, as you know, is like 74. My clients look a lot like Frank and Mary um, they, and their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. I'm always talking about those folks, you've seen them before. Uh, so today's presentation, uh, as you know, some of my presentations tend to be very broad, like every year in the spring, I try to do an elder law 101 presentation to tell you about things that have changed. Sometimes they're really specific, concentrating on a specific program, often um, some of the state administered programs. Then sometimes they're in between, and today is in between. <clears throat> so the purpose of today's program is to talk to you about protecting your home, um, which is probably the most common reason that people talk to me in the first place. They come in if they're older because they're worried about protecting their home, because they want to make sure that they can like Frank and Mary, that they can live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. Um, like Frank and Mary's estate plan is very simple. If one of them dies, they want, to leave they want to leave everything to the other one. And if the two of them have died, they want to leave everything to the kids. Does this sound like a familiar basic estate plan? But most important, they don't want to run out of money before they die, and they want to live in their house until they die. So this presentation is not about crisis planning. In this presentation, we're not talking about, oh my God, Mary just had a stroke and found out she's staying in the nursing home, now what? It's really about people who are trying to, to plan ahead to make sure that, like in their case, that they don't run out of money. So we're gonna assume that Frank and Mary have a house that's worth about $400,000, which is a good sized house in, in Ashland, but not a big, big house, you know, prices have really kind of migrated up, and that they've got other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to about $500,000. So. They're on Social Security. He's getting a couple thousand a month. She's getting a thousand a month. They're going to be okay. They're going to be okay as long as there isn't a big medical emergency. But their question is, what if there is something big that they haven't planned for? Because if, if they're still in their 70s or 80, they're saying to themselves, this may not be enough money, you know, to make sure that the house is okay and to make sure that we're okay until we die. So what do they do? And, and, and one of their biggest concerns inevitably it will, of course, is that nobody wants to go to the nursing home, but they, ever, ever, I've been doing this for 41 years now. I've had 41 years worth of people telling me they're going to shoot themselves before they go to the nursing home. No one shot themselves yet. Still waiting for the first big one, right? Um, and and the, the joke is because they can't find the gun at that point. But no, it's, usually it's just because they just, you know, they, they, they kind of suck it up, you know, at that point. So the question, though, is if you need to prepare for that, what do you do? Now, usually when people come in, it's because they think that what they need to do is number four. They need to do something with a trust. And we're going to talk about that. And if you're, and if you're married and you're, and you're single and, you're, and you can't get long-term care insurance, there's no other alternative, maybe that's the right answer in terms of protecting the house. But we're going to talk about some other stuff first because I think that's the more important stuff. First, I want to talk a little bit about long-term care insurance. These are things, so there's nothing here that I'm recommending that you do there are a bunch of things that I'm recommending that you think about and then decide whether you want to do it or not. But one of them is long-term care insurance. So first of all, so just look to the bottom there. Don't assume uh, that you can't qualify for long-term care insurance, right? Or that it's too expensive. I always have clients, you know, if they, that I'll bring this up. Oh, you got long-term care insurance? Oh, no, I didn't even consider it. Premium's too high. Oh, well, what's the premium? Oh, I don't know. It's just too high, right? Well, no. Find out, you wanna find out what the premium is to see if you might wanna have long-term care insurance. Now, ironically, the major reason for long-term care insurance is no longer for long-term care. It isn't necessarily to try to pay for the cost of the nursing home care because that policy, to pay for the nursing home cost, really, that premium could be really high, right? Because the, the, your, your nursing home costs now can run twelve to $15,000 a month or, or four to five hundred dollars a day. 
So to get to buy that kind of policy, a four to five hundred dollar a day policy that's going to extend over a number of years, that's a big exposure for the insurance company and so the premiums tend to be higher, right? But one of the main reasons to get long-term care insurance is because of the other benefits that are provided in the policy. Usually a long-term care insurance policy, a new one, will provide for both assisted living and some uh, um, home, and home care protection in certain circumstances. Now, to start off with the home care, that, so if you're Frank and Mary, you never, never want to go to a nursing home. You also don't even want to go to assisted living. You really just want to stay in your house. That's the point. And the older you get, the more you want to stay in your house because you know that, you know, the one thing about your house is you know where everything is. You're never going to forget where the bathroom is in your house, you know, or where you put the salt and pepper. You know, you've been doing it for 40 years. You're never going to forget that. So you want to stay in your house. So the question then is really, if you're Frank and Mary, and Mary is starting to get, you know, having a little tough time getting around or is having some memory issues, and so Frank's taking care of her most of the time, the question is, can he take care of her all of the time? One of the biggest issues that I face with clients is folks where one of the two in a couple has dementia, early to mid-stage dementia, the other spouse is taking care of them, but it's 24-7. You just, you know, you can never get out of the house, you know? So the, and if you're Frank, and Mary is heavy, for want of a better term, and you gotta be picking her up, you know, to help her to go to the bathroom, to help her to dress. Sometimes you just can't do that. And I always tell my, my clients, I said, you know, if one of you has got a, is, is, is got a problem and the other one's taking care of them, the last thing you wanna do is die. Because if you die, then the other person probably is going to the nursing home, you know? So you've gotta be, take care of yourself to take care of them. So in that case, Home care can be really handy. Not home care that's 24-7. Home care that's 24-7 costs more than nursing home care, right? Because, because home care costs 25 to $30 a, a day or an hour right now. And say it's a $30 an hour. Well, well, there are 8,760 hours in a year. It's one of those little pieces of trivia, right, that you get to know. That's a quarter of a million dollars, right? So you're not gonna do 24-7 home care, but if you need a few hours, so say you had a long-term care insurance policy that will pay $150 a day. That's not a really big policy, right? $150 a day though, if you figure the going rate at an agency right now is about $30 a day, um, that's five hours a day, right? Well, that's a lot, you know, to be able to have a home care person, professional person come in, help with meals, help to get, you know, get, get folks, you know, dressed and get all that stuff done give you a break, right? So you can go do all the stuff that you've got to do. Go do your banking, blah, blah, blah. Come to the senior center, have a couple beers. Oh no, I guess there's no place you can have a couple beers. But you know, so, it, so it's a really important piece for Frank to, and Mary to stay home. Second, um, assisted livings. If you, typically, if you can show that, you, that one of the two of you, if you're going to assisted living, requires assistance with the activities of daily living, which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring. I've, I've repeated this a number of times, but usually if you need assistance with two of those, not necessarily a lot of assistance, not necessarily assistance every day with those things, um, and the assisted living provides them as part of the package, and I'll give you the classic example that I heard from a woman named Linda Surveys, um, who, who, who I think was here before, talking about veterans benefits. She's like this national expert on veterans benefits and happens to live like in Marlboro, her office is in Sudbury. Um, and she says, you know, so if you need help, you know, cutting your meat, right, so that you can eat it, well, that's needing physical assistance with eating, you know? Well, that's one of the five activities of daily living. So once again, never assume that, that you know what, you know, what, what the real definition of this stuff is. But if, if you need that kind of assistance, then this payment may be paying, help you pay for assisted living. Now, once again, $150 a day, that's $4,500 a month. Now, that's not gonna pay for a nursing home, but that pays a lot of the assisted living bill. I know a lot of assisted living, well, I know there's a very nice one in, in, uh, in uh, Westboro where they don't have a lot of ex additional services, but it's like 3,500, 4,000 a month. I know the one right here, the residence at Lee, at Lee Farm. It's wonderful, it's a, or is it Lee, no, the residence is at what is it called? It's right down Route 135. Fairview? No, the other one. The other one, not Fairview. In Ashland. It's oh, the, the Ashland one. 
the resident, I can't remember. But anyway, it's not like $8,000 a month. You know, it's like five or six. So if you had that long-term care insurance policy and you needed that care, that's probably going to allow you to do it. That together with your social security check means you're probably going to be in assisted living without having to dip into your savings. Finally, <clears throat> if you want to protect your house, all you need is a long-term care insurance policy that pays $125 a day for two years. As long as that was the original benefit on the policy, and as long as when you go to the nursing home from your home, you have not exhausted all the benefits. In other words, you've kept at least one day's worth of benefit on the policy. Then, and, you, and if you own a home, the home is safe. Home is it, can't be leaned. There can't be any claim against it following your death, no matter what the value of your house, right? For that little policy, for $125 a day for, for two years. Now, the premium on that policy is not real big. Right? Because the maximum payout on that policy is only about, well, if you do that math, 730, 730 days times 125 is like not a lot. Right? It's like around $90,000. So, so the premium is not that high. And suddenly you've saved your house. And remember, they had a $400,000 house. That permanently saves the house. Don't have to put it into trust. Don't have to do any transfers, nothing. You have to just keep your house. Okay? Um, one thing that one kind of speaking of insurance one insurance policy that I would not recommend you get um, there is this new pol kind of policy that I've heard about because you know in this business you just kind of hear because these agents are always trying to talk to you saying oh you know did your client need this does your client need that and so there was this person that was telling me oh there's this great new policy where for example if you're Frank and Mary and say say Frank's dead and Mary needs to go to a nursing home and she has two hundred thousand dollars left in cash that she has to spend down. Well, she doesn't really want to spend it on the nursing home. And this guy says, oh, we got a deal for you. You pay a, you pay a single premium. It's a single premium life insurance policy for $200,000. Now, the benefit is only like $250,000 or $300,000. You name your kids as the beneficiaries. But as long as it doesn't have a surrender value, even if you can borrow against the policy, as long as it doesn't have a surrender value, technically, under mass health regulations, that policy doesn't, it doesn't count as an asset because a policy only counts to the extent that there's a surrender value, that you can get cash out of it um, um, while you are alive, right? And now I heard that and I said, well, that's very clever, but I don't think that's gonna fly. That doesn't really sound like, because the policy typically would name your kids as the beneficiaries. That doesn't really sound like you bought a life insurance policy. It sounds like you just made kind of a deferred gift to your kids through the vehicle of this life insurance policy, because most of the value isn't life insurance, it's just the amount you put in. Well, sure enough, there was a case um, in New Mexico Supreme Court uh, where somebody had done this, gone to the nursing home, Medicaid disapproved them, they went to court, it finally went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the court said, in fact, that the purchase of that policy was not really the purchase of a policy, it was really a gift to the kids, right, and therefore, the value that was in the, 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 the woman involved ended up being not eligible for, for Medicaid for a term equal to the value of the, the amount that she put in. <clears throat> but of course, in that case, she had a real problem because she couldn't get it back out, right? Which means that she couldn't pay the nursing home, so <laughs> she was out, so this was all bad. So you, 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 you hear about these policies, stay away from them. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that. Second, reverse mortgages. Now, once again, I suggest these to clients, they go, oh, I would never do a reverse mortgage. They're awful. Well, why is that? They take your house. They do, right? Or, 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 you know, this is nothing but a scam. I've heard all these terrible stories about this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about reverse mortgages for a few minutes. So, to understand a reverse mortgage, you need to understand a home equity loan. You all heard of home equity loans. What is a home equity loan? A home equity loan is a loan that's given to you by a bank and it's typically a line of credit, right? You go to the bank and you say, what I really want is, I want a home equity loan, they're gonna give me a value based on some percentage of the value of my house, um, and also based on my income. And, and it's gonna be, say it's 70% of the value, of the, or 50% of the value of the house. They'll give you a home equity loan, and the but the rules are, you don't have to make any payments to the bank unless you've borrowed some money. I mean, you start, the home equity loan is just a line of credit. So you give the bank a line of credit note, promissory note, secured by a mortgage on the house, and it, the, and it says, 
if you borrow the money, then interest starts accruing, and then every month you have to make a payment, right? But of course, if you don't make that payment, they can foreclose on the mortgage, right? That's a default under the, under the mortgage. So the defaults of a, on a home equity loan are if you don't make the monthly payment, or if you die, most people don't realize that. Not only if, if you're dead, not only are you dead, but you just defaulted under your mortgage, right? So the more, if your wife is left, she's got to go refinance it or she's going to get foreclosed on. Uh, or if you sell the property. If you sell the property, and in all of those cases, what you need to do is you go to the bank and get the payoff of the mortgage. You know, how much is the principal? How much is the accrued interest? That's what you pay the bank, and you pay off the mortgage. So a reverse mortgage is, is nothing but a home equity loan, uh, except that, First of all, the amount that they were willing to give you on your line of credit is determined not by a fixed percentage of fair market value, but rather by a percentage that varies depending on your age. So the older you are, the more money they'll give you, the greater the percentage of the fair market value that they'll give you because they figure you're going to be dead soon, right? So if you're really old, right, they'll give you a lot of money if you're 100 on a reverse mortgage because pretty soon they're going to get their money, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing, by the way, there's one little adjustment to that, which I've, I've mentioned here. Um, so reverse mortgages were not, this was not like an invention of the banks. This was an invention of the federal government. The federal government created the program that allows reverse mortgages in order to allow people to use the equity in their house, to stay in their house. And so what they said, and, and, and the only reason why any bank will lend on a reverse mortgage is that if for some reason on the reverse mortgage the bank ends up upside down, that there's more owed than the value of the house, if they're all federally insured. The FHA pays the gap, right? The Federal Housing Administration. Now, because of that, they're also heavily regulated. The federal government, HUD, writes the mortgages and controls the regulations. So one of the HUD regulations is that no matter how much the value, actual value of your house, for purposes of figuring out this percentage that you can get, the maximum value they'll use is that, $636,150. Where did these numbers come from? They come from the sky, I don't know. This, this is an old, an old number that gets adjusted with inflation every year, so this year's number, that's the number. So to give you an, ex an example of how much you might get if you were doing a reverse mortgage, in that case, if you had a house that's worth $636,000 uh, or more, then, and, you were, and, and you're Frank and Mary, and, and the younger of the two of you is 75, then they'll give you $312,000, or a little over 40% of the value. If you're 85, they'll give you $375,000, or about 60% of the value. Just to give you kind of a sense, right, of, of how much they'll give, and what they give you is a line of credit. So you can borrow up to that line of credit, right? So once that is in place, it's just, it's if you, now, so that's how, the, that's how that amount gets, now, another difference, between the home equity loan and the reverse mortgage is, while you, once again, you don't pay any, you don't accrue any interest if you haven't borrowed anything. If you do borrow something, well then you start accruing interest on that. Except, if you don't want to, you don't have to make the monthly payments. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. So say, in, but because in, instead, at the end of the month, if you don't make the payment, that amount, the payment amount, gets added to the principal. So take for example, today, Today, in the market, a reverse mortgage, your, your, your adjustable, they, then they come in adjustables and fixed rates, just like regular mortgages. Your adjustable is going to be about 5%, like 4 to 5%. So say that the interest rate on the reverse mortgage was 5%. So, and say that you borrowed $100,000 out of that. So 5% of $100,000 is $5,000. $5,000 divided by 12 for 12 months means that monthly your interest is about $400. So say you've borrowed the $100,000 and it's, you've been out for a month and, and, you, don't, and you, don't, either don't, you don't want to make the payment, right? So you don't have to, but what happens is then that $400 gets added to the $100,000. So the following month, your interest is based on a, a loan of $100,400. So it goes up by that little tiny amount, the interest on that $400, okay? So that's kind of how they, that's how they work. So, so you don't have to make the payments, which is a big deal in terms of cash flow if you're a senior, right? So that if you need something for the house, if the boiler goes, if whatever, or if you're, Frank, if you need that home care that we were just talking about, right? And you don't want to drain all your savings, right? You just can pull some money out of the reverse mortgage, and that's how you take care of Mary, right? Is just by using some of the money from the reverse mortgage. So 
there's, there's no default if you don't pay. It is due if you die. Actually, not when you die, but within one year of the day of your death, right? So within one year of the day that you die, you need to either, I'm going to answer all questions at the end, that's okay. It, within one year of the day that you die, you have to either pay it off, you have to pay it off, either by refinancing. So if one of your kids is living in the house, he's going to have to go get himself a mortgage to pay off that mortgage, right? Or by selling. And then just like when you sell your house, you know, if you've got a mortgage, it gets paid off at the closing, right? There's only one other th th default, and that is if you stop living in the house for 365 consecutive days, um, that is a default. Um, so what you do, if you got one of these reverse mortgage and you stop living at the house because you moved to assisted living, right? Uh, or because you're in a nursing home, I tell my clients, if you really want to be on the safe side, you got to go back to your house one day a year. Have like an anniversary trip, right? Back to your house, have a little party, maybe buy the newspaper for that day with the date on it, take a picture, right? Oh, I was back on June 4th, right? 2017. One year from the day that I got my reverse. Just to show, it, because the, while the reverse mortgage companies, you know, as a practical matter, never check any of this stuff, right? If you want to be safe, that's what you do. So the point is, once you've got your reverse mortgage, now you've got this line of credit. So if you're Frank and Mary, you know you've got 500,000 in the bank, right? But you've also got a reverse mortgage for another two or three hundred thousand dollars. So now say you do need a lot of, Mary does need a lot of home care, right? And now you're deciding, especially if you're Frank and Mary and most of your hundred thousand dollars is in tax deferred money, right? It's like an IRA or 401k and you got a choice, right? Now Mary needs a lot of home care. Maybe she needs you know, maybe she needs $150 a day worth of home care times 365 days. It's like $40,000. So you got a choice. You can pull it out of your tax deferred money, except, oh, you do that, you got to pay the tax on that money, right? So to get $40,000, you probably have to pull out 60. Or you can just pull the money out of your line of credit because you got the reverse mortgage, right? So it gives you some options, right? One final thing, which I'll mention, and this was something that I didn't know. You know, you think you know everything, and then you read, and then you find out you're such a dope because you don't check. So um, I, had a, I always assumed, I would always tell clients when they were looking at, when they have a home equity loan, or if they have a regular mortgage, and they want to protect their house, once again, if you're married, if you're single, and you want to protect the house by transferring an interest out to an irrevocable trust and keeping a life estate, we're going to talk about that in a little while. I would always tell people, well, you know, you need the permission for the bank to do that, right? Because otherwise it's a transfer and therefore it tri it's, a foreclose it tri it's a default under the mortgage. I always assumed that that was true for reverse mortgages too. Until this year when I had a client whose husband had died and they've had a reverse mortgage for years, but they've got a lot, quite a bit of equity because the property's value's gone way up and, and, and the wife wants to make sure that the kids get the value at the end. Um, so she wants to transfer this property to an irrevocable trust for the benefit of her kids. She's going to keep a life estate in the property. And I said to her, I said, I, I said, I think you need permission from the reverse mortgage company to do that. And then I read the reverse mortgage and it turns out they didn't. Because in the reverse mortgage, as opposed to in the home equity loan or in a regular first mortgage, there's a provision that says that is, even if you've transferred out some interest in the property, in this case, a remainder interest, as long as you've kept something, like a life estate in the property, the giving of the remainder interest does not constitute a default under the mortgage. So you, if you do one of these, and then after you've got the reverse mortgage in place, you do, you do this transfer to an irrevocable trust and keep the life estate so that you can wait out the five years and therefore protect the house. That's all okay. You haven't, you haven't violated your reverse mortgage in any way. So, this is, I'm telling you broadly what I know about reverse mortgages because I, as a lawyer, I also asked a guy to come, him, Steve Greenberg. He's going to tell you a little bit more because that's all he does. He does reverse mortgages. Now, I don't get fees from Steve Greenberg. We don't get, I don't get clients from Steve Greenberg. I have referred people to him because my clients have been very satisfied. So that's why I asked him to talk. If my clients stop being satisfied, I'll dump them. So, but, but could I ask Steve? So Steve, say, say a few things about reverse mortgages. 
Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming and taking your time today. You know, Arthur really makes my job very, very easy because he explains reverse mortgages very well. So I'm just going to reiterate a few things that he says. One of the most important things and one, one thing that a lot of folks really don't know and a lot of articles that you read about reverse mortgages don't tell you is that this is an FHA mortgage. HUD sets all the rules and all the regulations, housing and urban development. Um, FHA insures the loan. The only thing they don't do is lend the money. And that's where we come in as the lender to lend that money under HUD and FHA guidelines. And believe me, if we skip a beat on those guidelines, we're out of the business. And that would be a very bad thing because at reverse mortgage funding, that's all we do. We don't do anything else. All we have is reverse mortgages. So as we always like to say, we better be pretty good at it. So Arthur, as I said, makes my job very easy. And what a reverse mortgage really comes down to is an option. It's another option to access another bucket of funds for you in order to take care of whatever that need might be when that need arises. As we all know, whenever a need arises, something is going to take a hit to satisfy that need. So what's the most prudent avenue to take that hit? Is it cash on hand? Is it the 401k? Is it the stock portfolio? Or might it be tax-free funds from a reverse mortgage that you can access? And I say tax-free simply because this is a loan. You are loaning yourself money. This is not income. So therefore, the IRS says that this is non-taxable. Also, another important piece that Arthur um, touched upon is the FHA insurance part. These are what is known as non-recourse loans. And that's an extremely important term in the loan world. What non-recourse means is that the only asset the lender has to recoup its dollars is the value of the property. The homeowner, the heirs of the estate, any other assets of the estate are all off the hook if you get in that upside down position because of this non-recourse feature and because of the FHA insurance. So when you're thinking about what's the next what's going to be my next best step you know I need to plan for retirement long gone are the days when you retired at 62 and passed away at 62 in a day we can spend 25 30 years in retirement and so the again I go back to the word option is the option of opening up the equity in your house to add to the other aspects of your retirement. It is a piece of your retirement puzzle. It's not going to solve the puzzle. It's not going to be the cure-all. But it is a great addition to whatever other assets you have there in order to move forward. Um, in the brochure there, all my contact information is in the back of it. I'll be here to uh, after this to answer any questions. And thank you, Arthur. Thank you. So anyway, that's reverse mortgages. And once again, like with the long-term care insurance, I'm not saying I'm not re saying do them. I'm saying check it out. You know, you if you, you want to, if if they, if you worry about this stuff, as I always tell people, you get to our age. I am, you know, I'm in that sort of retirement. I'm 67. I'm going to be 68 in January. You get to that age, you know, fame and fortune has passed us by. The goal is to sleep well at night. If 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 you're not sleeping well at night because you don't think you got enough of reserve, then you might want to think about that. Okay. <clears throat> Second, if you got that house, tax deferral, which is nothing but the town giving you a reverse mortgage. So if you are over 62, or if you're Frank and Mary and either one of you is over 62, or not 62 or older, um, and you've been living in Ashland for five years or more, and you've been living in the Commonwealth for 10 years or more, right? then under certain circumstances, under most circumstances, no matter what your other assets are, um, if you go to the assessors and tell them, even if you're getting other abatements, you got a veteran's abatement, you got whatever abatements, that you want to take the rest of your taxes or some portion of them and defer them until you die, the assessors have to allow you to do that, right? Now, there were only two, there were only two requirements. There, there is, each community sets its own minimum income requirement 
regarding what your income can be. There's no limit on your assets, but they can put a cap on what your income can be. But it can be as high as over between 60 and $70,000 a year. I don't know a lot of seniors that earn more than 60 or $70,000 a year. So most people, this, this is a big deal for them. Uh, I apologize, I didn't check with the assessor's office here to find out what Ashland's magic number is. Uh, do you know what that number is? No. Uh, uh, Is the question is it individual per, or per couple? And the answer to that is that too, the town can decide. The minimum they can do is twenty thousand dollars per couple, right? But most towns are much higher than that. So you want to check just to find out what that income. And by the way, if it's really low, I know that in one community where I, I do I do a lot of work in Hudson, and the Council on Aging is actually considering doing a Warren article at the next at the next town meeting to boost this income amount. Right, because they've never done that. They're still, so they're still at twenty thousand. And and I, I told him I said I had a client, I had a client with his husband and wife. They lived in this house forever, you know, and they're both retired. And the wife's got dementia, and the husband's taking care of her. Um, and 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 but their biggest bill, except for their food, is is the tax bill. But between the two social security checks, they make like twenty five thousand dollars a year, right? And so they can't qualify. This is nutty, right? And so the, the Council on Aging is actually going to the town with a Warren article, to, or, or, or is thinking of going to the town with a Warren article just to boost, it, boost that number, because most towns have already done it. And I'm sorry I don't know Ashland's number. The other thing is <clears throat> they can charge you interest on that. The maximum they can charge you is 8%, but towns can vary that down to zero. I know a number of towns that actually, in, Mar in Marlboro's case, your maximum income is like $65,000, and the interest rate is like 2%. And, and communities do this because they want, you know, this is kind of like a public benefit. They want you to stay in your house. I mean, you've been taxpayers for years and years and years, you know. And it isn't like they're losing anything because, like with the reverse mortgage, they get a lien on the property. So that the thing becomes due if you sell the property or on your death. So it's basically just a reverse mortgage that's give, being given to you by the town. So you should, you should check that out. Um, <clears throat> Now, the irrevo irrevocable trust, or irrevocable trust. You can pronounce them either way. Um, the question is, do you need that? Well, to understand the answer to that, and, and I, you know, I see a lot of familiar faces here, so many of you, have, forgive me if you've heard this before, but to understand the answer to that, you have to understand Mass Health 101. So here it is, once again, Frank and Mary have a house worth 400,000 and cash worth 500,000. If Mary needs nursing home care, or needs care at home in order to avoid the nursing home, and in either case wants to qualify for Mass Health so that Mass Health can pay for that care, she has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank, in either case, can own the home no matter what the value of the home, um, and, 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 and no matter what the equity in the home, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $120,900, and can have unlimited income. Therefore, all that Mary would have to do to qualify, I'm not going to go through that, all that Mary would have to do to qualify is shift all the assets to Frank. The home is now not countable. He has to get his, at his other assets below 120,000. 120, so what he does is he, he keeps, say, 100,000 in the bank. He buys an annuity with the rest. Remember, he has a total of $500,000. The couple has a total of 500,000 in cash. So he's going to buy an annuity for $400,000. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and if Frank were 75 at this point, his life expectancy would be about eight years, um, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Frank buys the annuity, thereby reducing his other assets to below $120,900, Mary qualifies for Mass Health. Right? So the house is not exposed in any way. Now, by the way, by the way, under current regulations, if Frank buys that annuity, and so those monthly payments are coming in during that term, and Frank dies during the term, he can name anybody he wants as the beneficiary of those remaining payments that are going to come in during the rest of that term. He can name his kids, he can name anybody. Under a proposed mass health regulatory change, which has not occurred yet, remember I've in a couple of the seminars earlier this year, I told you that there had been these proposed regulations that were proposed last November, and MassHealth assured us all that they were going to get implemented last February, and it hasn't happened yet. 
So, you know, you never know, right? But we think this regulation will change. If this regulation changes, what they will say is that in that situation, Mary's in the nursing home, assets get shifted to Frank, Frank buys the annuity, Mary gets on mass health, then Frank dies during the term of the annuity. In that situation, mass health would have a lien on the remaining payments to get repaid. And so if that happens, what we're going to be recommending to Frank is that Frank buy a, a, short, a short annuity so that he reduces the chance that he's going to die during the annuity term. Because remember, the annuity can be as short as he wants. It just can't be longer than his actuarial life expectancy. So it, while Frank, but in terms of the home, while Frank and Mary are both alive, if one of them needs nursing home care, there's no problem, right? Because Frank can own the home no matter what the value. Um, and, and, and by the way, the other thing Frank would do in this case is he would also change his will because he'd make, remember his, his old will said everything goes to Mary. Remember that was the original estate plan? So he wants to make sure that instead of everything goes to Mary, everything goes in trust for Mary's benefit. As long as he does that, any assets he owns at death will go in trust for Mary's benefit and will therefore not be subject to any mass health that won't be countable and won't be subject to any lien. So all the assets can be protected. And the final distribution out of that trust following Mary's death can be the kids, can be anybody he wants. No lien, right? Um, but what if Frank didn't do that? Those are always the sad cases, right? The single person who, who tells me they really want to protect their, well, not sad, it's just kind of reality. They want to protect their assets because their husband just died. And I say, whoa, geez, that's a little late. You know, you could have done that before he died and they all be safe right now by having the will with the trust and then having everything in his name. But now things are in Mary's name, so now what does she do? Because she wants to be able to know she can save her house even if she needs nursing home care or, or needs a lot of care at home. Well, in that case, what she needs to do, if she's got those assets, specifically regarding the home, she needs to transfer, you know, I'm not going to go through those, it's a little late. She needs to transfer her house out to somebody. It can be to the kids. But more typically, it's going to be to an irrevocable trust. She'll name, she'll name the child that she trusts the most as the trustee of the irrevocable trust. She will transfer to that child as trustee a remainder interest in the house. That is, the interest in the house that starts the moment she dies. She will keep a life estate in the house. That is, the interest in the house that lasts until the moment that she dies. Five years after she has done that, the remainder interest will be safe if she then needs to qualify for Mass Health. In that case, she'll qualify. Mass Health will put a lien on her life estate, but following her death, her life estate evaporates, right? Because she only owns that the life estate ends at death, and therefore so would the lien, and so the kids will inherit the house lien free. So um, that's, that's, that's the, the one and only time that Mary needs to look at doing a transfer out. If she doesn't have that long term care insurance policy, right? That, has, that pays $125 a day for two years. Because if she has that, she doesn't have to do any of that, right? And if she's single. The other alternative, obviously, is that Mary could get married. But they never take that one. I've been suggesting this to years. What do I, oh, what do I do? I, get married. Oh, I can't do that. Well, why not? You know, otherwise, you've got to wait five, you know, transfer your house out and wait five years. But they don't take my advice. So uh, just a couple of like, little tips. Um, if you've just got like one child, as opposed to a bunch and so you're afraid they might argue, you can also just transfer this remainder interest to that one child and keep the life estate. And then five years later, you know, that interest is valid. The only problem with doing that or transferring the remainder interest to your kids is that now your kids actually own it. So, I mean, once again, I'll give the two examples. I had one it was actually on Martha's Vineyard where a lady had called me because she was concerned she had done this transfer many years before to her one son of the remainder interest, kept a life estate. It was more than five years. She knows the house is safe if she needs nursing home care. <clears throat> but, but the son's wife just served him with divorce papers. So she said, have I got a problem? I said, oh yeah, you got a problem. I said, the son owns the remainder interest in the house. At your age, which was about 80, that's worth, that means the remainder is worth about 80% of the value of your $800,000 house, right? So that value is now going to be part of that divorce, right? Because it's the sons, right? The second, the second example was that the, uh, I had a, no, was another family, actually, interesting, on Martha's Vineyard, where they had, they had moved from Boston. Af, it was an Afro-American family who moved to Oak Bluffs. Oak Bluffs 
has always had a large Afro-American community. Tr traditionally, the New York actors would go there for vacations and stuff. One of the reasons the Obamas always went. It was a big, big, you know, well, fairly wealthy community. So, so anyway, they had, they had moved from Boston. They had, a, they had a place in Oak Bluffs, and they finally moved to Oak Bluffs. But they wanted to make sure the house was safe because the va values are really high, so they transferred a remainder interest to their four kids and kept a life estate. And, and now they're still healthy. They're in their mid-80s, and everything's great, except their income isn't really huge. And they want to move back to Boston to be closer to the grandchildren. But in order to do that, they've got to sell their house. So, but in order to sell their house, they've got to have everybody, they have got to get, everybody has a remainder interest. Give them back the remainder interest so that they own the whole house. Then they need to live there for two more years so they can get the capital gains exemption. And then they need to sell their house. And the only problem with that was they did, th they did this, and three of the kids were fine with doing this, but the other one wouldn't do it. And so they said, well, what can we do? And the answer was nothing. There's nothing you can do. Right? They, he owns that interest in the house. They said, well, could we take out a reverse mortgage so that we could get some of our equity? I said, sure, except that other son has got to also sign on the reverse mortgage. Right? Oh, they, he'll never do that. So that's the reason why typically you would do a transfer to the, typically everybody has, you've heard me say this before, has some, a trusted child, and it's usually a daughter, right? It's usually a designated daughter, right? And everybody, when I, and everybody knows it's true, right? Because whenever I say that, people go, oh, yeah, well, you know. Um, and, 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 you, and you know that one is, 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 is always going to be okay, right? If you need the, if, so and that's who you transfer it to. And then the trust says, following your death, that everything gets divided up among all the kids. So anyway, that's that. Um, if, you've, if you're just dying to see this again, you can watch it on, on Ashland Cable. We're having this filmed. Or Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, um, Elder Law Frank and Mary, so you can go watch it there. And remember that the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. That's the goal of life, to sleep well at night. Thank you very much for coming. I look forward to seeing you at the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you.